The clerk will open the court. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. The Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the state of Texas and this Honorable Court. Good morning. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to require adjustments of the justice system. Social distancing and group size restrictions, as well as substantial hardships on council traveling to Austin, make it difficult for us to hold arguments in our courtroom. Accordingly, we are proceeding through remote connections. Court staff has made every effort to prepare us and counsel, but of course there may be glitches that will require patience. Otherwise, we will proceed as we would in person. The arguments are being live streamed and a recording will be available later today. We're ready to hear argument in 18309, Burkle and Company Contractors against Lee from Brazoria County and the 14th Court of Appeals District. Justices Lehrman and Busby are not participating. May it please the court, Mr. Wright will present argument for petitioners. Petitioners have reserved five minutes for the vote. Good morning, Chief Justice Hecht, and may it please the court. I want to thank the court again for doing this extraordinary job of trying to keep on track during the pandemic. Of course, we all look forward to being back in the, in the courtroom. I would like to address two points in the time that I have allotted. The first is whether the Court of Appeals adoption of the expanded uh, view of the exception to the exclusive remedy, that is the, the localized area test found in a comment to the restatement, not in the black letter, uh, was correct. And second, whether a remand in the interest of justice is appropriate. Of course, I think the first question has been resolved by the Movac case. Movac uh, discussed at length the history of the workers' compensation statute, the purposes of it, discussed the restatement and its development, uh, found that the expansion and the comment to persons within a localized area uh, was unworkable, but also found that the court had effectively rejected that in Reed Tool and quoted from the Reed Tool opinion on several occasions and uh, quoted the language that said, because there was no evidence that Reed Tool was substantially certain that Mr. Copeland would be injured, uh, there's no evidence to, uh, to support that intention requirement. So I think that puts that issue to rest. There is no evidence in this case, as the Court of Appeals found here, and as Lee basically concedes, that anybody at Burkle whether Mr. Miller, even if he's a high enough level person to bind the company in this circumstance, or anyone else uh, was substantially certain that Tyler Lee was going to be injured. No one knew, Mr. Miller did not know, and no one on Burgle's crew knew where Mr. Lee happened to be standing at that point. He was far away uh, on an elevated, in an elevated area doing something else, talking to another subcontractor behind a fence, uh, no one knew which way these leads would fall, nor can that ever have been predicted. And Mr. Lee says in his uh, brief on the merits that uh, all of this is of no legal consequence. Of course, that was before MOVAC was decided, and MOVAC makes it the central and dispositive issue on that point. The next issue, of course, is uh, whether a remand in the interest of justice is uh, appropriate. Well, we didn't think a remand in the interest of justice was appropriate even under the Court of Appeals expanded standard because there was no way that um, Mr. Lee could ever prove that and because uh, they specifically rejected opportunities to put that in the charge. I'll talk about that in a minute. But what is the standard for remands in the interest of justice? This court has said on numerous occasions the reliance on a change, on a law that has been changed, that is where a precedent has been overruled or this court has changed how they want the issue submitted. That of course was the Torrington case. But uh, apropos to this case, 
in most of the cases that have been decided since 1980, there's been a precedent that was relied on by the losing party that was overruled. Boyles versus Kerr, Twyman versus Twyman, the Hamrick case, and uh, Westgate, the 1992 case that we've cited from this court, says the most compelling reason is where we overrule existing precedents in which the losing party relied at trial. And uh, that's the reason those cases have been remanded and where that is not true, that is where there has not been the overruling of a precedent, this court has declined to remand in Kerr-McGee. Mr. Wright, <clears throat> on that, on uh, Justice Boyd here, on that issue, your second issue on remanding in the interest of justice, you're articulating standards by which we've made that decision in the past. But my question is, what's the standard by which we should review a court of appeals decision to remand in the interest of justice? Shouldn't that be abuse of discretion standard? I don't believe so. Um, it's, uh, you know, the standard has to be set by this court. And then if the court of appeals articulates, it's sort of like the new trial motion. Uh, where a court of appeals grants a new trial, you're requiring them to articulate how they meet the standard. So the standard, of course, and the rules is a little different for the court of appeals and for this court, as we've uh, discussed. And of course, in this case, the entire foundation of the court of appeals remand in the interest of justice has been undermined because they adopted a test that this court later rejected in MOVAC. So I believe for this particular case, you have to look at it anew, no matter what the standard is. But I believe uh, it might be well for this court to articulate the standards under which a court of appeals uh, should remand in the interest of justice. And one of the difficulties is, it's really up to this court and not the courts of appeals to uh, overrule precedent. Um, so in that area of, uh, of consideration, you have to take into account that it really should be this court overruling precedent, and uh, that clearly has not happened here. We have a case similar here to what uh, the first court of appeals decided in the Encore case, Encore Electric, which we cited, a dispute between whether it should be a premises case or a general negligence case, and the defendant asked for it to be submitted as a premises case, and the plaintiff refused. And when the court, Justice Bland writing for the court, found that it, indeed it should have been a premises case, they declined to remand in the interest of justice because the plaintiff had had the opportunity. And here we have the same thing. We asked for a charge to be submitted that would focus on Tyler Lee. In fact, uh, our opponents were well aware of the Reed Tool case. They cited it. Before trial, they submitted a question a proposed question that talked about whether the consequences were substantially certain. The issue that was submitted, of course, only asked whether uh, somebody in the course and scope at Burkle uh, was substantially certain that injury would result, just injury, not the injury, doesn't even say a personal injury, but. So it, Mr. Wright, yeah. um, in this case, it's a little bit different than MOVAC because you've got a particular radius where there's testimony that it was substantially certain that someone would be injured. Uh, maybe not Mr. Lee, but someone within a specific period of time. Is that distinguishable from MOVAC? Uh, even, even adopting or even uh, carrying forward the substantial certainty test that requires you know, a specific time and a specific planet? And if not, why not? Well, you know, every case is different. Whether the, the difference makes a difference is, is really the question. I don't believe it does. I mean, what you have here is other people uh, saying they were substantially certain something was going to happen. Uh, you know, they've kind of mixed it up. They said one person that's quoted by the other side, I believe even in their bench exhibits, says, I was substantially certain that something might happen, something bad might happen. Well, substantially certain and might is not going to do it. The person who was operating the, uh, 
crane, of course, sitting in it, was taking directions from Mr. Miller on the ground, who was the most likely person to be injured if something like this happened. And Mr. Miller was not trying to break the crane. That would have been against the economic interest of himself and the company. He was trying to get the auger unstuck. He was not substantially certain the crane would collapse. He was not substantially certain if it did, that anybody in particular would be injured. So, you know, I think that because of the standard adopted in MOVAC and the rejection of the restatement comment, uh, this issue has been uh, resolved. Um, and, you know, and it's not like we didn't tell the other side that they needed to get a finding that Mr. Lee or the injury in question or something like that uh, should have been the focus. So, um, you know, we made that point many times. We made it in uh, uh, charge objections and uh, tendered instructions. But the other issue that courts look at in addition to these is the futility of a remand. In many of the cases that have been remanded in the interest of justice, uh, they come up from a summary judgment. There never was a trial in the first place. So they're remanding for the first trial. This case, of course, has already been tried. Over 40 depositions were taken, 11 days of trial testimony. It's impossible to believe that Mr. Lee, represented by some of the finest lawyers in the state of Texas, didn't do everything he could to prove whatever level of intent he could. And the reason that my opponents asked for this uh, charge question over our objection that did not have any specificity in it is that they wanted to ask a question they could get a yes answer to. There is no evidence and never will be any evidence that Mr. Lee was substantially, or that Mr. Miller was substantially certain that Mr. Lee would be injured. Did and your client move for summary judgment if, if the case is resolved as a matter of law? Um, yes, uh, and there were two issues at that time. On the, the intent? I'm sorry? Did, did you move on, on the basis that there was a lack of intent? To yes, we did. Yes, we did. The, but the other issue, uh, uh, Mr. Lee and his counsel were challenging whether the OSIP was proper. They didn't believe that Mr. Lee was actually subject to the Workers' Compensation Act. And so if they're not subject to the act, then it doesn't really matter whether it's intentional or not. And so um, the trial judge denied the summary judgment motion uh, without giving a reason. And in fact, until the case went up into the Court of Appeals, in fact, we had to brief the OSEP argument as appellant in the Court of Appeals. By that time, this court had ruled in other cases that uh, this kind of OSIP does work, so to speak. And so um, our opponents gave up on that point and have focused only on the uh, intent requirement. But yes, Your Honor, we did move and that was, that was denied. Um, we, don't, we don't believe a remand in the interest of justice, of course, uh, could possibly uh, help under the standard announced in MOVAC. Um, there's no uh, indication that they could ever find. In fact, as I said, the other side has said, uh, whether there was any substantial certainty that Tyler Lee would be injured is uh, beside the point. Well, that means they can't prove it and they don't believe they ever can. Um, so we believe that the uh, Court of Appeals uh, judgment ought to be reversed in part, that is the remand part, and that this court ought to render judgment, adopt the MOVAC test for this case, and render judgment that uh, the plaintiffs take nothing and if there are no further questions, I'll yield back some time. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Wright. We'll hear from the respondent. May it please the court. Mr. Post will present argument for the respondents. May it please the court. I come to the court today not to bury Movec, but to praise it. Because by rejecting Burkle's pleas to abolish the intentional tort exception and to abandon the substantial certainty test while embracing the substance 
of Justice Christopher's application of that test in this case, MOVAC supports the precise judgment which is under review, which is, of course, a remand for a new trial in the interest of justice. I have two requests for the court today. First, I ask the court at the very least to affirm the judgment ordering a new trial in the interest of justice. And second, for the benefit of Texas jurisprudence, I urge the court to clarify the particular victim requirement of MOVAC. With respect to the first request, um, yes, Your Honor. Mr. Post, this is um, Justice Guzman. The um, opposing counsel has argued the futility of a remand in light of MOVAC uh, and that um, under the standard we announced, uh, you can't possibly prove uh, your case. Can you, can you talk about that? Absolutely, Your Honor. The record was not developed with direction to the particular victim standard adopted in MOVAC because at the time of this trial, this court obviously had not yet announced that standard. I think as counsel essentially makes our point in his argument, the MOVAC decision while this case was pending in the Supreme Court and fully briefed resolved that issue. So we tried the case originally with the understanding that the localized area test was the law. And I'll speak to that issue a bit more in a moment, but let me speak directly to the futility point because it is not the case that the plaintiffs will be unable to meet the MOVAC standard, even if it is defined so precisely as to require that Mr. Miller was substantially certain of an injury to Tyler Lee. Since the decision by the Court of Appeals, the plaintiffs have contacted the witnesses who testified at trial to focus on the precise question that Justice Christopher had identified, which is congruent with the MOVAC question. And they are in a position and prepared to testify that it was in fact substantially certain to Mr. Miller that Tyler Lee would be injured. Tyler was standing directly in the fall path of the leads. He had actually walked up to approach this job and was calling out warnings to Mr. Miller. And so he was directly in Mr. Miller's line of sight and he was directly in the fall path of the leads. And I want to point to one item of evidence that's in the record that will illustrate to the court why it is very reasonable to believe we can meet even the highest version of the MOVAC standard. If you would look to page 14 of my bench exhibits, tab 14. This is a still image of a video that was taken during this episode. And this is an image of the leads and the auger. The leads are the metal structure and the auger, you can see the bit at the front of that structure. You will notice that the leads are leaning. If you look in the background of the photo, you can see a power pole that's at vertical. And so you can see the angle of inclination of the leads. What happened is as the crane was operating, as the crane was tipping forward, the leads pushed forward. The leads are suspended by a cable from the top of the boom. They're not affixed. And so they're supposed to be at vertical. And if you look at tab 13, you'll see the way the leads should appear in an ordinary configuration where they're suspended at vertical. But because of this operation, the leads had pushed forward. That angle may not appear to be much in this photo. But remember, this is a 150 foot tall piece of industrial equipment. At the top of that 150 foot leads, the displacement by this angle is five feet off of the vertical. That's a tremendous amount of weight off of vertical that is being suspended only by the tension of the cables. It was obvious to everyone that when the crane failed and when that tension disappeared, the leads would fall. And the law of gravity made it clear to everyone on that site that the leads could fall in only one direction. That was directly down the line they were leaning. And in fact, that is the direction that the leads fell. And the testimony of the new trial will be that Mr. Lee was standing directly in that path and he was calling to Mr. Miller, trying to give him warnings. And so the suggestion that it would be impossible for the plaintiffs to meet that standard is simply false. And I point out to the court that in your interest of justice cases, the court invariably, when it clarifies or changes the law, says it is not evident whether the plaintiffs will be able to meet a new standard on remand, but they are entitled to the opportunity to try. When the court changes the rules of the game after the trial, the plaintiff is entitled as a matter of basic due process to a fair opportunity to meet the burden of proof. And we can- Mr. Post? Yes, Your Honor. 
Uh, how do you distinguish this case from our Levinson case? Well, Your Honor, I think Levinson is a very different situation because in Levinson, you didn't have a question about a jury instruction about clarifying the manner in which the case should be submitted to the jury. And so what I would point to in that respect is this court's decision in R.R. Street versus Pilgrim Enterprises and the Torrington versus Stutzman case where the court said, when this court clarifies the manner of submission to the jury, that is a classic case for an interest of justice remand. And in R.R. Street, the court said, no court had ever discussed the manner of the jury charge for this sort of theory. And so that's exactly what we have here. And that's what Justice Christopher said. She said, this is the first case in Texas to address a substantial certainty question that is submitted to a jury to defeat the exclusive remedy bar. Because we've clarified the law in that respect, the plaintiffs are entitled to a new trial. And in that respect, Justice Boyd, I want to pick up on your question about the standard of review, because I think it's important. It is, in fact, an abuse of discretion standard of review. For generations, this court has recognized that the courts of appeals have the same jurisdiction and the same discretion that this court has to remand in the interest of justice. And so Justice Christopher applied those traditional principles, recognized that she had clarified the law in Burkle. That analysis is even further reinforced by the fact that the court has now further clarified the law in Movac. She had the discretion to order that remand in the interest of justice. And unless this court finds an abuse of that discretion, this precise judgment should be upheld. I do want to speak a little bit to the test for interest of justice remands, because I think it's important for the court to understand the extent to which we fall squarely within that standard. The court has repeatedly said that when it clarifies the law after trial, the parties are entitled to a new opportunity to try their case under the clarified law. It is not the case, as Burkle argues, that that test requires an outright overruling of prior precedent. The court has frequently remanded in the interest of justice simply because the law clarified or evolved in the aftermath of the trial. And the court particularly says it's appropriate to remand when the law has evolved and it appears that there would be a viable claim. And as I've just explained in response to questions, there is a reasonable basis to believe plaintiffs can meet the MOVAC standard now that the law has been clarified. But I want to, yes, Your Honor. Mr. MOVAC says that all of this was settled in Reed Toole and that this is nothing different. What's your response to that? I think, Your Honor, that overreads the language of MOVAC that counsel is relying on. Precisely what MOVAC said was that the localized area test was, and I quote, effectively rejected in Reed Toole based on the facts of that case. But certainly that's not what the court said itself in Reed Toole. The court identified the question presented at page 405 of the Reed Toole opinion. The court said the question was whether an employer who intentionally maintains an unsafe workplace in which an employee is injured may be held to have intentionally injured the employee. And then at page 407, the court framed its holding very precisely to answer that question and to say that intentionally maintaining an unsafe workplace is not an intentional injury. Nothing in the Reed Toole opinion spoke to the localized area test. And I think it's quite reasonable for counsel in this case not to have anticipated that Reed Toole had overruled or in some way prejudged that case since no one else ever thought that either. Certainly Justice Christopher for the 14th Court of Appeals didn't think that Reed Toole foreclosed the localized area test. On the contrary, she said, and I quote from her opinion, the localized area test was, quote, the correct standard. She treated it as a means of satisfying the particular victim requirement. She didn't say it was not the correct standard. She said it was the correct legal standard. She simply defined the localized area differently. Now, remember, when you're looking at- Mr. Post? Yes, Your Honor. So later in Rodriguez v. Naylor, didn't we draw the distinction and say the question is whether a reasonable jury could have found that the defendant's actions were substantially certain to harm the plaintiff personally, as we found they were in the Rodriguez case, in contrast to a substantial certainty that someone would be injured? 
You are. That, I don't... That's, uh, that's taking retool and drawing that distinction. And no, so you are. I don't do believe. About, what do we do about uh, Rodriguez? What do we do about Rodriguez that 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 made this distinction in affirming a verdict for the plaintiff. I don't think that that's correct, that Rodriguez itself particularized the inquiry to say there is no like localized area test. The localized area test was not at issue in Rodriguez. There was a summary judgment ruling. A summary judgment, you're right. And it involved simply a summary judgment with respect to one particular plaintiff. So there was no reason for the court to have entertained any discussion about the substance of a localized area test at that time. So it is not correct to say that Rodriguez in some way foreclosed that. On the contrary, I think the fact that in MOVAC, this court reaffirmed Rodriguez is a powerful indication of the correctness of the interest of justice remand in our case, because in Rodriguez, the court found sufficient evidence of a substantially certain injury where there was evidence that a supervisor had to know a blowout was certain and deliberately exposed an employee to that known risk and continued after the risk had manifested. The evidence in this case is much more compelling than in Rodriguez with the sole distinction that in Rodriguez there was a single employee at issue. But in that respect, I invite the court to remember the hypothetical that Justice Busby posed in the rebuttal of the MOVAC case, because I think it is telling. He said, what if the supervisor in Rodriguez had ordered five drivers to go out on trucks with the same dangerous tires, with the same knowledge that those tires were fated to blow out? How could it be less culpable that you expose more workers to injury? And let me modify that hypothetical slightly. What if the supervisor in Rodriguez had ordered five crew members into the single truck that he knew was substantially certain to blow out and roll over? That's our case. Our case is indistinguishable from Rodriguez with respect to everything that is material here, except the question of how particularized the inquiry about the plaintiff must be. And that brings me to the second point that I wanted to make with respect to the remand in the interest of justice, because as I've indicated, we have evidence that can satisfy the narrowest version of the particular victim standard. But for the benefit of the jurisprudence of the state, I invite the court to clarify the particular victim standard in two respects. First, the court should clarify that in certain cases, and this is one of them, there can be multiple particular victims. And second, the court should clarify that Texas law has not abandoned the traditional doctrine of transferred intent, which has been tort law for as long as the substantial certainty rule has been the law. And by that standard, if it was substantially certain that any particular victim would be injured, then the injury to Mr. Lee is an intentional injury without respect to whether the defendant knew Mr. Lee would be injured. Let me- does, uh, Mr. Post, does the doctrine of transferred intent apply to recklessness or gross negligence, it, it, if you have the conscious desire to injure someone and then a third person is injured, uh, that's transferred intent. How, right. how, does, how does a lesser mental state than the specific intent to injure or kill? Your Honor, the restatement is unequivocal on this point. The first restatement and the second restatement make clear that whether the state of mind is desire or knowledge, and of course, substantial certainty is the knowledge mens rea. In either scenario, the doctrine of transferred intent applies. And so if a defendant asks with a desire to injure a particular individual or acts with substantially certain knowledge that a particular individual will be injured, then whether that intent is directed at the plaintiff or a third person, the same conclusion follows. And that appears in the bench exhibits that I've provided for the court. I provided in tabs one through five, the first and second restatement of torts. And so I admire the extent to which MOVAC traced the substantial certainty test back to section 13, comment D of the first restatement of torts. And all I'm asking the court to do here is to give me that same old time religion. 
Because when you look at section 13 of the first restatement of torts in black letter law, Justice Land, it answers your question. It says, if the actor acts either with an intent to harm the plaintiff or with substantially certain knowledge that the plaintiff will be harmed, without regard to whether that knowledge is directed at the individual plaintiff who suffers the injury or a third person, that's the language the restatement uses, a third person, in that instance, it is an intentional injury and in that case, the plaintiff can recover for an intentional tort, even if the defendant didn't know the plaintiff was there. That's illustration three to section 16 of the first restatement of torts. And so what, what do we do about the jury charge, though? Because if if we if we agree, uh, at, but that the defendants asked for a charge uh, based on substantially certain knowledge with respect to a specific person, uh, but what got submitted was an unspecified injury to an unspecified person, even even though it was brought to the attention. I'm uh, delighted you asked me this question, Your Honor. I'm, I'm pleased to have the chance to answer this question. I urge the court to look at volume 17 of the record, pages 268 to 271. And that is where you will find the defendant's objections to the charge and my response. The objection to the charge was that the question should inquire about substantial certainty of injury with respect to Tyler Lee alone. There was not an objection about applying a localized area test. There was not an objection about a substantial certainty of injury to any other person. The defendant's position was it has to ask about Tyler Lee alone. And you will see at page 271 of the transcript I engaged in a colloquy with counsel because I wanted to be certain I understood exactly what objection was being made. And I point out at page 271, we are relying on the restatement rule. That is the localized area rule. And remember, this is not some stray comment. In comment E to section one of the restatement third, the rule is laid down that this is the rule for occupational injury cases to identify the limits of the substantial certainty test. I said, relying on that restatement rule, we don't have to specify the individual plan. Now, it is not the case in the interest of justice cases that because your opponent takes a position that ultimately proves to be the law when the law is clarified in another case, that you were somehow on notice that you had to exceed your opponent's position. The question is, did the law evolve? Did the court change the law? And that's what happened here. And so it's not the case that Burkle made an objection that our question inadequately submitted the localized area test. And it's not the case that Burkle made an objection that a specific intent question could include anyone other than Tyler Lee. They said only Tyler Lee should be submitted. And that is not the law. I don't think it was the law as we understood it at the time of the trial. And I don't think it's the law today because there can be more than one particular victim of a particular incident. Either in the transfer of intent context. I'm sorry, Joe. Go ahead. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. I can't. I apologize for interrupting. No, counsel. It, it seems that uh, please don't worry about that. That uh, it, we're losing sight, perhaps, of the fact that there's a statute here, the Workers' Compensation Act, and ultimately what's going on is that that statute's being applied. Now, the, the intentional tort exception is a judicially uh, engrafted exception to the statute, but as we're sort of casting about for ways to to define the intentional tort exception, it seems like one touchstone might be that we ought to stick as close to the statute as possible, and it does not contain an exception. Uh, if, if that's not the touchstone, then what, I mean, we're just sort of casting about for some notion of the, the defendant's blameworthiness or culpability, or what, what, what are we looking for? How do we, how do we apply that statute honestly and, and define the intentional tort exception with respect to it? I think this is an important question. I'm pleased that the court asked it because discussions of the so-called intentional tort exception, I think actually mangle precisely what's going on because the statute doesn't refer to intent in so many words in either respect, either as an exception or as a burden of proof. What this court has construed the statute to mean since Middleton is that the statute covers, quote, accidental injuries. It's not a distinction between negligent or intentional conduct. It's a distinction between accidental 
and non-accidental injuries. And that's why the substantially certain test is a correct orthodox test of tort law in this context, because an injury that is inflicted knowingly is not accidental. It may not be with the same degree of scienter as a desire to cause harm, but it is not an accidental injury. The court for 100 years has stood by that interpretation of the statute. Movac said, and I quote in closing, that that case was an opportunity to provide clarification about the meaning of the substantial certainty test. And under this court's interest of justice remand cases, we are entitled to an opportunity to meet that clarified standard. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Post. Mr. Wright, you have five minutes. Sorry, I may please the court. I was trying to get my camera working. Um, I'd like to start where, with what uh, Justice Blacklock said. We're not talking about tort law in general. We're talking about an exception to a workers' comp uh, statute where the plaintiff has already been compensated. Okay, this is not whether he gets any cause of action at all. The trade off in the workers' comp arena, of course, is the employees get compensation and the employer is guarded from other third party or other actions, uh, you know, other than the exclusive remedy. Now, my uh, esteemed opponent says uh, the court in Movac overread two of its presidents, uh, Reed Toole and uh, Naylor. Not true. The court did say in its opening that uh, something about clarification. The clarification standard, and this is important, in remand in the interest of justice, is clarification of uncertain law. This court not only said that we effectively rejected it, the uh, localized area test and read tool, went on to quote read tool several times. We very plainly stated uh, there has to be evidence that read tool knew with substantial certainty that Copeland would be injured, that it was substantially certain her husband would be injured. A particular employee from a definitive risk is what this court says Reed Tool held, and Rodriguez likewise. The, I urge the court to look at the charge objections and the tenders as well. There's never been any case out of this court uh, that said you can just ask about any injury. Mr. Lee was not relying on precedent. He was relying on his attempt to change the precedent. He was relying on a comment in the restatement. It's not the black letter of the restatement. Comments don't set out rules. The black letter sets out what the ALI thinks the rule ought to be. This court had never accepted that comment. This court sometimes accepts restatement provisions. Sometimes it doesn't. Council knows that. We argued about this in pretrial motions. We argued about this in pretrial submissions, even his own pre-trial submission of a jury charge focused on the injury, whether somebody was substantially certain that the injury would occur. So for him to say, well, they were relying on the restatement because they thought that's what the law was, um, I don't think gets you there. And I'm a little bit surprised, maybe the court was too, that now we're hearing stuff completely outside the record that we've never been told about, that they've gone out and interviewed witnesses. And now these witnesses are gonna say, oh yes, Mr. Miller, genius that he was, is standing there and knows which direction those leads are going to fall when the crane collapses and that it's not going to hit him and none of this other stuff that's falling is going to hit him. But he wants to hit Tyler Lee standing, uh, you know, 100 or more feet away. Tyler Lee's testimony was, yes, he did try to call down to people in the last seconds before this happened. Last seconds. And nobody heard him. So there's no evidence that Miller knew that Lee was there. And all of these other people, the former employees who were, you know, uh, sometimes former employees or have their reasons for saying things, I don't know what they're gonna say uh, in, in a new trial. But the point is they shouldn't have one because for these lawyers to come in and say, we thought that all we had to do was prove a localized area when not one court had accepted that uh, it is just wrong. And so, um, I, if I said that Movac changed the law, I, I repent 
uh, Movac did not change the law. It says it didn't change the law. I mean, you didn't give a remand in the interest of justice in Movac itself. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's no reason to give one here. It's, it's the same law that this court has had since Reed Tool, since Naylor, and that is you have to prove that there was uh, substantial certainty that this person was going to be injured. And why is that? We have a narrow exception that this court engrafted uh, 100 years ago in order to save the constitutionality of the workers' comp statute. But does that, Mr. Wright, does that position require us to reject the longstanding doctrine of uh, transferred intent? Transferred intent was never raised in the trial court. Uh, you don't have to reject transferred intent. They don't have that either here. Transferred intent in normal tort law is fine. I suggest that you not deal with transferred intent until it actually comes up in a case. And that there's proof that somebody knew that X was going to be injured to a substantial certainty, but instead Y. There's no evidence in this record that Mr. Miller knew anyone was going to be injured. They didn't submit it to the jury. They didn't uh, argue this at all in the trial court. If there was a point about that, uh, it's been waived. I see my time has expired. We thank the court for your attention. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Wright. The case is submitted and the court will take a brief recess.